गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई वेलकम यू टू दिस ऑनलाइन सेमिनार ऑन स्टडी अब्रॉड बाय डॉक्टर अनूप एंड इट्स लाइक अ प्लेजर टू हैव यू ऑल स्पेशली ऑन संडे इवनिंग विद सो मच ऑफ इंथुजियाजम I am Sharvari Kulkarni, and I am working as a technical associate of BDG Life Sciences, OPC Private Limited, and we are biodiscovery group of life sciences, OPC Private Limited. We are working since ten years in the field of biotechnology, biopharmaceuticals, and bioinformatics. We are serving students, researchers, professionals in the field of biotechnology. since 10 successful years we have been training thousands of indian as well as international participants that is participants all over the world and i can proudly say that we are the first to start drug designing online programs and we are also the pioneers of ngs analysis online so uh, it is a great pleasure to introduce today with a new area of overseas education and i would like to tell you that today we are have organized this seminar or online seminar on overseas production with uh, overseas education which is uh, a collaboration of in uh, ignatius zillis and bdg life sciences so first of all i would like to introduce you to the speaker dr anup dr anup kulkarni is he has completed his ms and phd from uk and in the this is it's in the field of uh, oncolo in the field of molecular oncology and is awarded with 90 lakhs of funding for his phd work he has experience of sending students all over the all over seven countries with the scholarships and currently he is working with multiple biotech industries and uh, with specifically in the areas like clinical research regenerative medicine biomedical engineering cell based assays development currently one of his organizations are involved with counseling of students and professionals who are willing to pursue their ms bs and mba in the countries like usa germany australia new zealand and singapore so uh, i would like to also mention specifically the reason why we have organized this seminar is i feel it is the right time for students to prepare for their gre tofl examinations and to have a right guide for them at the right time is very important so this webinar i'm expecting that will enlighten them and provide them a very good guide about uh how to proceed for their overseas education so anu dr anup has successfully uh, conducted many webinars and he has got a very good response and i have uh, 100% guarantee that you all also have benefit of his uh, guidance today and uh, so now without wasting much time i would like to hand over to dr anup uh, over to you dr anup uh thank you very much uh, shahari good evening uh, good evening to all of you and thanks for bdg life sciences for allowing me to be part of this session so uh, i'm just you know uh, i think i have bit of network issue so i'm just going to switch off my video but of course uh, you know i'll uh, share my screen so please let me know in, in case if you are not able to uh, see uh, you know in, in my slide so just one minute all right okay uh, so i hope you can see my slides and i'm just going to start my presentation so as shadwari introduced me of course i i come from the same uh, biotech fraternity as all of you are uh, i'm assuming that and uh, i was uh, i mean i was in the uk for five odd years i did my masters and phd in the uk uh, and it was in the field of molecular oncology and of course i was awarded with a very good uh, grant because phd has to come from the grant otherwise it's very very difficult and of course in day to day of my life i i i'm involved in lots of different activities i'm uh, associated with uh, various biotech industries in india 
so basically what I do, I'm involved in biomedical uh, engineering devices, uh, you know, uh, then again, clinical research. So we have plenty of, you know, um, biopharma and pharma industries uh, where we help them to, you know, get clinical trials done uh, across different hospitals with respect to different drugs. And also, um, I also work in the area of stem cells and regenerative medicine, um, along with, you know, cell-based assays development. Um, and, you know, the reason why I started this overseas education, because I felt, you know, uh, that this particular field has a very good demand, but uh, it comes when only when, when it comes to skill sets. So if you have skill sets uh, with you, you have pretty good, uh, you know, um, employment opportunities. And uh, when I was in the UK, I mean, unfortunately, there was nobody, you know, who could, who could have guided me, uh, you know, properly. But, you know, there are tremendous number of opportunities. There are so many varieties. There are so many countries across the globe where, you know, one can go and make the career in. Uh, so without wasting time, you know, I'll just uh, go to my slides. So please let me know, Shervari, if, uh, you know, if, if you're not able to see my slides. Okay, so I've changed my slide. Uh, uh, Anup, we can see it very well and you're uh, audible also properly. Uh, so I would like to just mention one point that uh, for, to all the participants that we have uh, provided a link uh, for uh, putting up, uh, filling up the form if you guys are interested after the webinar is over for contacting us. So kindly refer to the form which is there in the chat box. So I'll be putting it uh, again. So please refer to that form and check it out. Yeah, please proceed on. Sorry for the interruption. That's perfectly fine, Shavari. So, right. So, uh, you know, I think I thought, you know, um, this, this is a typical, you know, time that we should have actually face to face seminars, but unfortunately, we are sitting at home, you know, and you know, we are having these typical webinars. And the reason we obviously know is because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's not just, you know, a problem of one state or one nation. It's, you know, a global uh, problem. Of course, everyone knows I'm not going to go into that detail. So uh, the point here I want to mention is, uh, you know, because of COVID-19, we are seeing a steepest, uh, fastest downgrades, uh, you know, in the growth projections of almost every industries in the world uh, and every country, you know, uh, all the GDPs are going down, economic recession is coming, industries, uh, you know, they are uh, trying to, you know, maintain very few staff, people are losing their jobs. So, you know, so many bad things are happening. But, you know, uh, what I want to tell you from this slide is there are many sectors affected, of course, and, you know, biotech sector is one of the sectors which was affected. Or rather which is affected and if i want to have a kind of a you know impact matrix uh, you know if i want to plot uh, plot profitability impact versus the short term liquidity uh, liquidity impact you can see there are multiple sectors uh, you know predominant sectors which are affected but pharma and medtech sector are the least affected sector because we could understand that you know uh, medical sector is not going to stop you know unless there's a population i mean you know if when, when there's a population if there is no population in the world, of course, every sector will come down. But medtech pharma sector is something, you know, uh, despite of the fact that we had COVID-19, uh, you know, pandemic, we had lots of, you know, lockdowns all across the globe. Still, the medtech and pharma was the player which was doing pretty well. And rather, it has a very, very bright future. And the one example, best example I can give you is COVID-19 vaccine, you know, because everyone in the world was waiting for the vaccine. And now there are multiple industries uh, are coming up or they already have their vaccines in the market. And there are many other industries who are, you know, launching their products soon uh, in terms of COVID-19 vaccine. So medtech and pharma sector, although it was affected, still it has a lot of bright future uh, in terms of industries, in terms of revenue generation uh, by the industries. So of course, I'll be talking about that sector very, you know, uh, in very in very short time. So today, uh, you know, I am I, I know that you know there are so many of my students um, who come to me for counseling and they tell me that sir, I mean, we heard that you know biotech has no scope, and uh, I mean there are many students who who tell their juniors you should not have opted for uh, biotech. You know, it's a very, very disastrous field. You, there are no jobs. You have to go for marketing jobs. You have to be a medical representative. You, you know, I mean, there is no bright future. But today, I'm going to prove uh, that biotech is the one of the best branches uh, in the world, rather, when it comes to an employment. And I'm going to show you some stats, okay, because I'm a hardcore scientist. So I like to see stats. And based on that only, I can say that, okay, this look, this is, this is having a positive future. So I'll show you that slide uh, in the middle of my presentation. So um, if I want to understand biotech, I think it has multiple sectors because biotech is not about just one sector. 
So it has a lot of sectors, healthcare, food, biomedical, environmental sector, bioinformatics, industrial biotech, animal biotech, plants and agri, and you know, we can have other sub branches also. Uh, and every branch has its own uniqueness. So I'm not going to talk about each and every sector today, but I, what I thought, uh, you know, since you come from a biotech background or, you know, life science background, you, you already are aware of these sectors. So I thought, why not to show you some employment opportunities and what kind of industries there are. So the first problem I think I would like to show, uh, I think if you are aware of this problem, you know, diabetes, you can uh, call it as a metabolic disorder. You can call it as a disease, you know, you can call it as anything, but um, what, how I see at this particular slide is India and China, and to some extent US, United States are, you know, the most affected countries in the globe or across the globe uh, who are having more number of diabetic patients. And if I want to see the projections by 2035, I can still see that, you know, it's India and China are leading diabetic, uh, you know, um, producers. So when I see this as a stat, as an industry, I see that as an opportunity. And now how, how are to, I, I'm going to see as an opportunity that there are many industries which are, who are coming with different, uh, you know, medicines, or you can say pharmaceutical drugs, uh, you know, which can be used uh, on the diabetic, uh, you know, people or diabetes. And why this thing is happening is because of the kind of lifestyle that we are living, you know, thanks to, you know, uh, the junk food that we are eating, thanks to the hazardous chemicals that, you know, we are consuming along with the food. So this is, you know, everything is, you know, uh, being accumulated and, you know, causing different metabolic disorders. It is not about just diabetes, but it also has a lot of different, you know, aspects to that. So, you know, a cancer, you know, I'm going to talk about cancer very soon. Um, apart from diabetes, cancer, there are n number of different diseases, which are because of, you know, our lifestyle. And these diseases are, you know, I mean, disease incidences are increasing year by year. And that is how you can check that double check with the hospitals if you want to see, you know, how number of patients are rising every year. But the opportunity that industries see is they, they would come up with different, uh, you know, novel or, you know, similar uh, pharmaceutical drugs or biopharmaceutical drugs, and they will make business out of it. And there, you know, uh, students like you can have, a, you know, good employment opportunities. One such aspect is your nutraceuticals because now we know so far that, you know, uh, I mean, the concept of organic food, but at, at also nutraceuticals is something, you know, which is like a, a kind of a, a upcoming field. It has already been established. And if I want to just show you the stats between uh, 2017 and 2024, in the United States itself, the cumul cumulative annual growth rate was 6.8. Okay, and this is something that we are expecting in last, you know, uh, you know, or next, you know, three, four years. So to 2017, it was the total revenue by nutraceutical market in the United States was $2,200 billion. And by just in next seven years in 2024, it is expected that it would cross more than $300 billion. So you can understand the quantum of business that these nutraceutical industries will be having in the future. And what I want to say from this slide is when we see that these figures are rising, that means industries are earning more and more money. When industries are earning more and more money, that means there are opportunities, you know, that industries can see. And when there are opportunities, why there are opportunities? Because the population is suffering from specific things. And, you know, when the, there are opportunities, there are recruitments because industries would like to hire more and more people because they want to come up with their new products. And this is how you have to see, you know, at the industries in different fields of biotechnology. So one field I told you, it was nutraceuticals. The next field I, I thought I can cover is biomedical sector because I'm already working with this. And I came up with, you know, two interesting slides, uh, you know, a few months back. The one comes from Ireland, which is on the left-hand side. Science Foundation International or IS of Ireland, sorry, SFI, is actually giving uh, around 12 million uh, euros funding to the industries or institutes or universities in Ireland who are actually involved in biomedical devices manufacturing or research. And they're actually motivating the scientists or industries or startups to come up, come up with new biomedical devices, which can cater the need of the patients or doctors who are actually having multiple difficulties. The right-hand side slide, uh, you know, the photo rather, you can see it comes from a magazine, which is Biospectrum. I'm sure everyone is aware of that. Uh, this, this is from 2019, December. And the, the first picture itself, it says that the indigenous medical devices and diagnostic industry in India 
is growing at the rate of 6%. And it has crossed around 36,000 crores altogether. So uh, the most important thing what I want to convey from this slide is there are multiple opportunities why the government of India is giving a lot of funds because they believe that this particular field has a lot of scope which is coming in the future. And at the same time, uh, you know, uh, I mean, one of my organizations where, you know, I give my consultancy, we got a good grant of around, you know, 30 lakhs to come up with a, a novel devices, uh, novel device, uh, you know, in the treatment of cancer. So such kind of grants are also also possible. And um, all most of the governments across the globe are actually, you know, uh, motivating startups and industries and uh, scientists to, you know, come up with new innovations or new solutions in the field of biomedical sciences. This is not about just grants. It is all about the industries because I always talk about industries because this is this is what we have to. We are all you know doing our education because we want a good job. And if I want to see top ten medical industries in the world, medical device industries in the world, uh, in 2020, we can you can see all these names: Thermo Fisher, Abbott, uh, you know BD, Siemens, Philips, G Healthcare. All these names, and you can see the figures you know in billion dollars. So that what this particular figure suggests that there are tremendous opportunities industries are earning a good amount of money because they feel that you know there's a more scope and they are coming up with new and new products okay and this is not about just these 10, 10 companies i can show you you know a lot of biomedical industries in the world uh, who are having very good revenues and when i'm saying that you know there are uh, coming up with more and more revenues that means there are more opportunities and more jobs okay uh, of course, I, I think I'll skip these slides, but you know, again, this is industrial biotech where, uh, you know, lots of, you know, it's all about fermentation of bioreactors. Uh, and I think I, I mean, I was, I, I was thinking, you know, I can show you a couple of examples of, you know, this detergent. So it has some uh, certain enzymes, so industrial enzymes. So this is area also is growing because to cater the need of, you know, growing population. Again, uh, tissue engineering, test tube baby are, uh, these are the fields which are under research, but it also has a promising future. Uh, one of the examples would be induced pluripotent stem cells, which is, uh, you know, a kind of a research oriented branch, but it also has an applied, uh, you know, uh, I mean, applied way. And, uh, you know, I think next 20, 25 years or 15, 20 years, we'll have some products, which is, uh, you know, uh, I mean, have a concept of induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, we also have bioinformatics. I'll, I think I'll talk about that a little later uh, during, at the, you know, at the end of my slides. So this is something I want to show you <clears throat> because this is very important because biotech is, you know, when anyone says biotech, I think it, it is more towards healthcare sector. Of course, I'm not uh, skipping other sectors because already, you know, uh, I mean, I was showing you some of the sectors, but healthcare is something which is uh, playing a major role in biotechnology. And some of the examples are vaccines, um, monoclonal antibodies or biosimilars. You can take that as an example. Insulin is one of the examples of biosimilars. So, you know, I thought I can show you a slide which will prove that biotech has more scope okay now you can see health at the top left corner uh, you know graph health technology sector profit margin if i see this uh, i have a you know stats till 2016 and you can see the you know and cumulative annual growth rate and you can they have compared it with finance technology electronics and other markets and you can see that the healthcare sector is pretty much you know booming it has a lot of scope because there are so many industries and again, there are so many, you know, uh, industries which are earning, you know, having multiple, you know, decent revenue. And I don't need to explain again that, you know, when there are revenues, there are opportunities. And if I want to just showcase, uh, you know, some of the figures of, you know, top biotech industries in healthcare, Roche, Novartis, Celgene, Johnson & Johnson, uh, you can always see their, you know, sales and profits in billion dollars every year. That's what they are having. So imagine the quantum of business these industries are doing. Uh, since I work in the field of cancer, I was, you know, very curious to understand, you know, how many new drugs are approved every year, okay, maybe monoclonal antibodies specifically to a specific type of cancer, roughly on an average 10 new drugs are launched in the market for specific cancers. So you can assume or you can imagine, uh, you know, the similar figures in different types of diseases. Okay, and these, these drugs are launched by the industries after doing all the clinical trials, okay. And if I want to see the global uh, oncology forecast model, uh, you know, I can always see this is very promising because uh, I can compare this with 2019 to 2018. And uh, most, uh, you know, countries across the globe, uh, not only restricted to US or Europe, but uh, pharmacy countries like India also is doing pretty well because we also have, uh, you know, a good pharmaceutical industry network in India. Uh, I mean, of course I can name very, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of industries, 
so these industries are actually uh, involved in you know having uh, oncology related products in terms of it can be a chemical drug or it can be a biopharmaceutical drug so uh, this market is tremendous and it is expected that you know it will rise like anything because the number of patients uh, suffering from cancer are rising day by day which is very unfortunate but that's how you know it's i, I told you it's because of the lifestyle that we are having but this is going to grow you can confirm this figure by you know visiting to any hospitals and so this is how it's working and you know you can see what kind of revenues these industries uh, might be earning every year sorry one thing i want to tell you is about um, the biosimilar uh, i'm sure you must have heard this term biosimilar technology or biosimilars okay it because it has a tremendous scope you know with respect to other sectors i think this sector itself you know having the best possible you know possibilities of having more employments in your life and i have a very good uh, you know graph which can you know you can see in 2014 by the time when i passed out in 2007 uh, from biotech engineering i think sharvari can correlate this we never heard of this biosimilar term because most of the industries were having patents so once this started going off you know from 2014 till 2020 you can see the growth of biosimilars how many industries are actually coming up with you know a similar biopharmaceutical drugs in the market and surprisingly, it has a cumulative annual growth rate of 49.1% in just last five or six years. So this explains that, you know, what kind of scope everyone is, every biopharma industry is going to have. And I think best example I can give you is vaccine only, you know, COVID vaccine. I know it's not a biosimilar product, but still, you know, you can imagine what kind of, uh, you know, uh, revenues that industries might be earning, you know, uh, maybe Serum Institute or, you know, uh, other, you know, Sputnik or, you know, Pfizer also. So these industries are, you know, having their own products and they're earning like anything, uh, thanks to their technology, of course, you know, we owe a lot from them. But uh, the overall motto of, you know, showing you this slide is there's a tremendous scope in biosimilar technology. And, uh, you know, some of the examples are human growth hormone, insulin, uh, erythropoietin, different types of MAPs, monoclonal antibodies, peptides, and there are so many other products which, uh, you know, which comes under biosimilar uh, sector. And initially, you know, 10 years back, US was the predominant, uh, you know, uh, player in this particular area. But now this total shift, uh, you know, it's Europe has taken all the, uh, you know, major uh, projects in this biosimilar sector. And, uh, you know, some of the countries like Ireland uh, is the leading country when it comes to biosimilar, you know, manufacturing. So I'm going to show that, you know, or discuss that uh, once I discuss the specific countries. <clears throat> So next slide comes from clinical trials. Uh, <clears throat> I think I'll just try and you know uh, go you know as quickly as possible. So clinical trials again, it was not that great in different countries uh, except US and to some extent UK. But uh, since I'm also involved in clinical research, we have different SMOs uh, you know all across Maharashtra. Uh, we can see that you know number of clinical trials are rising like anything. There are new uh, products which are being uh, you know. Uh, I mean, tested uh, in the patients and they will be launched very soon in the market. So that thing, clinical research or clinical trials area is also growing very, very well. And uh, there are so many opportunities, uh, you know, we can see in coming future, even today also. <clears throat> and these are some top biotech industries in the world, uh, Syngin, Pfizer, Roche, uh, Mylan, you know, Invitrogen, uh, BMS, Gilead, you know, and there are so many names. Some of them are in India. Uh, some of the uh, some of them are in the Western world. So um, what I have you know I can I have shown you so far, or at least I have tried to explain that biotech and its allied uh, branches have huge potential, scope, demand, and potential. And still, if you don't believe me that you know there are jobs available, the best thing you can do you don't need to trust me because I might be wrong. What you can do on your own, you can just log on to your LinkedIn account. Whatever, uh, you know, uh, name of the industries that I was showing you, you know, logos that you have just seen, you just go on their, you know, industrial pages and just like their page, okay? And every day I can bet you that you will see some advertisement, you know, of that, that they're hiring, okay? So that suggests that there are so many job opportunities in those industries where one can opt for. But this is one side, I think I told you. There are plenty of job opportunities. Yes, there are. And you can, you yourself can try that on LinkedIn. But there is a better truth that I also know, and I have to accept this, that there are so many students who, you know, they pass out from, you know, their degrees, maybe it is a BSc degree, maybe it's a BTEC degree, or maybe some, you know, masters in India. And those students really struggle a lot um, in order to find a good employment. <clears throat> and, you know, I mean, that's also a truth. I mean, 
let's say you know there are so many students who have very good decent marks 60 70% 80% but still they struggle a lot to find an employment quickly sometimes you know they change their field they you know just switch to some other fields and they try doing something else and this there is exactly the same story which i'm trying to tell you so there is a huge gap in india when it comes to an employment uh, or with respect to an academics and an industry and that's the reason why we call that as an industry academia gap okay and now why it is there sorry <clears throat> why it is there because there are two aspects that we have to consider or most important aspect is the skill sets okay now unless and until you guys have skill sets right skill sets you are not going to get any job and i'm going to show you what do I, what do i mean by that um, so i'll just keep that slide okay so most importantly uh, there are job openings like these so this comes from zydus cadillac okay i just you know took a photograph of that now when any industry wants to hire you they will first see you know what kind of qualification that you have that's the first thing second thing they will see what kind of skill sets that you have for an instance uh, i'm just going to uh, you know consider this particular vacancy <clears throat> so this is a senior scientific officer or research associate or you know whatever you can call and this is in terms of mammalian cell culture and cell and development now in india in many of the institutes we don't even have mammalian cell culture ha hands on practicals even though we have we, we do that under the, under the burners okay bunsen burners we don't have right infrastructure we don't even know how to run real time pcr by our own even if we know you know we don't know how to troubleshoot that so what i want to tell you is every vacancy has specific skill sets required okay and if you have that skill sets then and then only industries will hire you otherwise you know it doesn't matter whether you have 90% of the marks or whether you have scored you know more than 100 you know or similar to uh, close to 100% if you don't have the skill sets they are not going to hire you and the reason is very simple because if i am in i am an industry suppose i am a xyz industry in india suppose i am working in, uh, working on manufacturing covid vaccine and suppose uh, you know uh, i have few candidates who came for interview uh, and you know uh, if i find them that they are pretty good in terms of marks but they don't have any practical skills what i have to do i have to you know ask my employee to train those students for at least next 8 to 10 months you know uh, of teaching them how to run real time pcr how to do mammalian cell culture you know on different different aspects of molecular and cell biology so it is going to take at least 8 to 10 months to teach you and there is no guarantee that after 10 months you are going you will be there with me uh, you know my industry for at least next 3 or 4 years and at the same time i i am paying my employee salary and also i am paying you and the output is zero because product wise i am not producing anything actually i am wasting my energy so this is what is happening with the industries most of the industries rather that's what i can say so unless and until you have the right skill sets you are not going to get any particular jobs so this is a typical one uh, this comes from zydus cadillac i have uh, <clears throat> one more uh, you know such kind of uh, you know opening i mean uh, i would like to show you here it comes from pfizer and this is from united states okay now this is actually they actually require a scientist for tumor viral immunology and they expect a person who should have a relevant work experience and if you don't have that relevant work experience of in vitro or you know uh, working on specific signaling or related pathways they are not going to select you irrespective of whether you have 100 publications whether you come from a very reputed university they are not going to hire you unless and until the related skill sets area match with what they are expecting and if until and unless this doesn't happen they are not going to recruit you and this is the this is the exact problem in india and i'm going to specifically target india because india is a country where we have tremendous opportunities but unfortunately we don't have uh, students with the right skill sets and this is the reason why we have a huge gap in between academics and industry now exactly the reason why we are discussing this here because uh, i have seen there are so many students who go abroad now why to go abroad because of course it makes sense um, because the kind of universities and uh, courses that these uh, universities in the western world have they are very very dedicated to the specific uh, you know areas of biotech they have most of the courses which has a practical exposure and the third important thing is whatever they teach you in those curriculum is actually with respect to the industries which hardly happens in india now see i'm not blaming any specific country i'm not blaming india of course i have respect but we also have to understand the practical aspects of that 
Unfortunately, the Indian curriculum talks about more theoretical stuff. We never discuss any real-time case studies, industrial case studies. But in the Western countries, you know, even when I was doing my masters, we used to discuss real-time case studies of Pfizer. And this is how we realize that you know how industries solve their problem. And with this, you know, um, I thought you know I can um, talk about why you have to go abroad or what are the most common reasons that you have to uh, think why going abroad. First is experience a world without borders. Expand your knowledge base. This is something very important because you are a part of a global, uh, globalized world, and uh, you have a professors who have a very good reputation in terms of their publications or their you know uh, network with different industries. You might end up in having a learn uh, foreign language. Maybe if you go to Germany or some other country, uh, there are specific courses uh, which I think I'll show you uh, you know at the end of my presentation. And the most important thing why we are learning all these things because we want a you know job. So. To get an advantage of you know of the job market, not just any job market, but a globalized job market. I mean, you know, you can work in any of the countries where you are going for your, uh, you know, masters or you know uh, maybe bachelors, of course. So when we talk about you know going abroad, uh, there are so many countries. But unfortunately, you know, I mean, I have seen many students who always talk about US to some extent, UK. Okay, and maybe third option is Germany because they feel that you know education is free, so why not to go to Germany? But trust me, you know, apart from these three countries, there are so many other countries where you can go and you can make your career in. For example, Ireland, for example, Australia, for example, New Zealand, for example, Canada. I mean, you know, some non-English speaking like Denmark, uh, Switzerland, Netherlands, you know, and there are so many countries where, where you can be a part of, uh, you know, depending upon the areas of interest or area of, you know, specific sector. Now, there's always a confusion. So whenever I start my counseling sessions, uh, I mean, whenever a new student comes to me, um, the student is always confused because which country to choose, which course we have to choose, and it's always a confusion. So I have, I, you know, I uh, jotted down this particular, uh, you know, a kind of a routine thing. And this is what I tell, uh, you know, to each and every one of my students uh, who are confused with which country to choose and which university to choose. choose. The first is the stay back option. So uh, those of you who don't know what is stay back option, I'll tell you what is that. So a stay back option is nothing but uh, once you complete a master, suppose you have done your bachelor's in India and if you are going for a master's, uh, let's say in the UK. So once you complete your master's successfully, you are given a specific amount of time in that particular country so that you can start looking for an employment. Okay, you can start looking for jobs. Um, and this is called as a stay back option. So this stay back option can be of three months, it can be two years, it can be three years also, depending upon the country, because every country has their own rules and regulations. And this is a political thing because they keep changing, okay? Because if whenever there's a new government comes, it will change the policies, which is very obvious. So at the moment, uh, for example, you know, uh, a country like United States, if you complete your master's in United States, you typically get 90 days of time, okay? to uh, search for an uh, you know optional practical training or an internship in simple words and if you don't get anything you have to come back to india but if you get something uh, you know in that 90 days time you can stay there for longer time you know 3 years 4 years also a country like australia or ireland for instance they will give you 2 years straight away so once you complete your masters today you will be given 2 years to stay in that country so that you can start looking for an employment so this is called as a stay back option so more this time that you get out of this, you know, from the stay back option, it is always beneficial. The most important point comes is the second point, uh, the course and its relevance. So you have to understand what is the course that you want to pursue and what is the relevance of that particular course with respect to the industries. I know there will be some students who will be thinking about going for a PhD, but my, uh, you know, uh, my most, uh, I mean, like, uh, or rather my, you know, most valuable suggestion or an advice is, uh, you know, go for an, you know, masters, which can give you employment because for any employment, you don't need to have PhD. Okay. I mean, not immediately. I mean, you can work in the R and D sector in any industry with just masters also. It PhD is not required every time. Okay. And if you want, because there are two types of masters, one is called as a fundamental masters and the other one is called as an applied masters. So what is fundamental masters is a master's which will lead to kind of a fundamental research and an applied master is something you know through which you can actually find a job now for example a fundamental master suppose uh, is a master's in cell biology 
which will talk about you know how a disease is progressed so we don't know you know how uh, for example leukemia occurs so the people in this field will you know do a lots of laboratory research and they will try to investigate how a leukemia occurs inside the cells you know genetic network and everything this is called as a fundamental research and there is a one more masters which is called as an applied masters for example you know covid vaccine so we know how covid you know covid uh, i mean covid infection occurs and accordingly we will design certain you know uh, some products which can cure or you know reduce the viral load for example covid vaccine for example certain other drugs uh, you know which can reduce the infection of virus or virus viral titer so this is called as an applied masters so my emphasis is always an applied masters because it helps you you know to get jobs quite easily in the industries okay however the fundamental masters which yeah, you know they are very good when you want to make your career in the research and academic fundamental research okay so there are two types of masters i told you so you have to decide <clears throat> what kind of course you want to pursue with the relevance with what you want to do the third thing uh, you know to some extent you also have to see the world ranking the university ranking and the department ranking because both are very different university ranking is given to you know uh, a university considering all different aspects of the university it has multiple departments but a departmental ranking is given to the department of that university uh, you know considering different you know resources funding you know uh, you know campuses and you know multiple things so you all you have to see the department ranking more than the general university ranking you have to also understand the industries and research scenario in that country where you are going to pursue your masters and also in india because if you have to come back to india at some point of time you also should be aware that you know what kind of jobs you might get in india then comes the part of fees and scholarship of course you know that also matters because uh, you know sometimes it's very expensive to uh, you know pursue your masters in some countries like us so you also have to think about that scholarships yes they are very important and most of the universities they do give scholarships uh you know considering your academic and you know academic or um, you know your overall uh, you know cv or performance in terms of your bio data you also might want to check uh, the alumni record uh, you know through linkedin uh, you know that what students previous students are doing nowadays whether they really enjoyed the course whether searching the job through that university was easy or not so you can all uh, you know do a kind of a research talk to alumni uh, who have passed out from that university and the most thing, uh, important thing is a 10 year plan usually i uh, you know ask my student to you know and this is a typical face to face sessions that every time we have in the seminar so usually i ask my students to close their eyes for 2 minutes and think about their future so i ask my student what you want to be after 10 years or 20 years from right now and once you understand your goal suppose my goal is uh, for example you know i would like to uh, you know um, kind of a form uh, industry like biocon okay suppose kiran dr kiran mojumdar shah is my uh, you know i mean someone i really admire her so if i want to be like her this is my dream in next 20 years so what i would do you know uh, if this is my dream that you know how i can convert into a reality i have to understand what kind of qualification i want what kind of experience i want and then accordingly i will start looking for a similar degree which can lead me towards my destination after 10 or 20 odd years if you understand this i think this is very easy for you to search for an university for a course and you know everything in your life so think about your 10 years plan or 20 years plan in your life uh, as i said scholarships are also you know uh, given by most of the universities across the globe um, and they consider you know some of the criteria is like you know overall performance in your bachelor's uh, subject wise performance extracurricular activities co curricular activities you know uh, your practical exposure um, your final year project also does matter a lot Uh, and if you have work experience that would also matter but you know it is not required that every time you should have a work work experience in the industry right so uh, with this i think you know um, an important point comes because this is a typical confusion that students have every time they come to my office you know with uh, with respect to the finalizing the country and the course and uh, the first question that they have uh, and they come up with you know lots of rumors which are not true you know many times so uh, they always get confused with ms and msc because uh, whenever we see uh, say that you know this friend of mine is doing ms abroad so we feel that ms is something which is really good and msc is something you know which is a you know second you know second degree or third degree so first of all there is no difference between ms and msc and ms stands for master of science and msc also uh, you know stands for master of science it's that letter c which is creating a lot of confusion so basically uh, you know 
uh, countries like US and Canada, they don't like to you know, put that C letter in front of their MS. And that's why they call their degrees at mass, MS degrees. But European universities, they call their degrees as MSc. So they always put the letter C. That's the only difference you know, that uh, a typical MS and MSc has. Otherwise, quality-wise, quantity-wise, recognition-wise, equivalence-wise, there is no difference. So MS and MSc are same. Now, sometimes there are courses like MEng in biopharmaceutical engineering, MEng in, uh, let's say, chemical engineering. So what is that? So sometimes those univers some universities think that a specific discipline comes under an engineering uh, department. And they like to call their degrees as MEng, Masters in Engineering, rather than Master of Science. Okay, so again, there is no difference in between MS, MSc, and MEng. So what matters is what you have learned in that course. Okay, your degree title doesn't reflect anything. So whenever an HR starts, you know, interviewing your, yourself or you, uh, you that HR will see your CV, HR will see what subjects you have learned in that particular master's course. He is least bothered whether you call your degree as MS or MSc or MH. Trust me on that part. The second confusion is with respect to the duration of the course, because some countries like US, Canada, Australia, Germany, they have their master's, which is of two years. And while a country like UK and Ireland uh, specifically, they have their master's, which is of one year, you know, most of the courses, 99% of the courses. Now I get a lot of rumors again, uh, you know, there are so many students who start telling me, sir, uh, you know, that two years MS is uh, better because they are recognized by the industries and, you know, everyone and one year MS is not recognized. Okay. And, you know, there are so many rumors, you know, I can tell you some other time, but first of all, there is no difference between one year MS and two years MS. Okay. Now I'm sure you will get surprised. You know, you will ask me a question. How come it is like that? Okay. Now I'll tell you, I'll tell you how exactly the things work in those countries. A country like US or let's say Germany, they run two years master's course. Now what is their belief is they feel that students who are coming to their university, they are coming from diverse, you know, uh, different universities across the globe, diverse population. Some would come from JNU, some would come from, uh, you know, uh, Mumbai University, some would come from Calcutta University and so on. And some other, you know, students will come from Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, you know, China, Japan, even though their bachelor's degrees are same, let's say BSc Biotech, but their curriculum is going to be different. Their understanding of a specific subject is going to be different because in some colleges, the specific subject is not taught properly because we don't have right teachers. So with all these assumptions, universities with two years masters have their first year common, uh, you know, they have a common subjects, which you already have learned in your bachelor's course. And that's the reason why they have two years master's courses. Now, the first year is common, I mean, basic subjects where they want to bring all of you on a common platform. And then once you uh, get the right subjects, understanding of the subjects, then the second year would be an advanced subjects in that particular master's. Also in the two years masters that uh, they have a lot of vacations, let's say they have total of, you know, roughly five to seven months vacations so that you know you can do other things while you are doing your masters now in one year's masters courses typically which is run by you know uk and um, ireland which are again non english speaking countries they they believe that your basics are clear so they don't want to waste your time and money and they don't want to waste their time and they will start with the advanced subject straight away okay so that means there is no difference in between one year's masters and two years masters in one year's masters you hardly have any vacations you get hardly 15 or 21 days out in the one year duration uh, you know in, during typical summer and christmas vacations but in two years masters you have almost five to seven months vacation you know you have a long summer vacation you have long winter vacation but that doesn't happen in one year's masters the benefit of doing one year's masters because you save a lot of money for your second year tuition fees and living expenses because you can understand you know th there's a huge amount of expenses that you have to put if you specifically want to go for two years masters so think about which masters you think uh, is a good one uh, because you can save time and money <clears throat> and the most important thing when it comes to equivalence or uh, recognition all these one year masters courses are recognized all across the globe now if you don't believe me uh, you know, I can name you some universities. I'm sure you must have heard about Oxford University, University of Oxford, University of Cambridge, King's College London. You know, all these universities are in the top 10 in the world. They have their masters, which is of one year duration. Now, I'll ask you the question in another way. If 
one year masters are not recognized in the industries for an instance why you think why would you think that you know those universities will run one year courses because they all they also must be knowing that you know our students are not getting jobs why to run one year masters let's have two year masters course so since that is not happening you know one year masters are very much valid and the best example is me because i have done my one year masters in the uk and so far no industry in, in india has asked me you know we cannot select you because you have done one year masters so that never happens what matters to the industry is what you know what kind of knowledge that you have and how that knowledge is going to be beneficial for that industry that's what is checked if you have the right skill set you will be employed otherwise sorry okay i hope this understanding is very clear uh, you know with respect to one year ms msc Uh, sorry ms and msc and one year masters and two year masters now there are certain exams that we have to crack um, you know gre tofel ielts gmat i'm sure you must have heard these uh, terms and terminologies now i have seen um, you know many students who haphazardly join some classes for gre and they waste their money you heard me right they waste their money because gre is not required every time for every country GRE is most, you know, I mean, predominantly required in the universities in the United States. Um, some, you know, okay, most of the universities in US they will ask you for GRE. Not all universities in US will require GRE. Second thing, GRE is not required in other countries for very, very op, uh, except you know some optional courses. So let's say ninety nine percent in other countries GRE is not required. Okay, so. many times student opt for a class they waste their money in tuition you know some you know 30 40000 of you know uh, you know uh, gre classes then they get very bad score and you know they again have to spend you know money in sending that score to the respective university so they waste around 1 lakh rupees in you know sending their scores to the university which is not even required many times okay so first understand which country you want to go which course you want to go and accordingly what kind of exams they are expecting from you if they have a gre in that list yes you should definitely go for gre if gre is not at all required then guys please don't waste your time you know because you are wasting your valuable time you can use that 1 lakh for some paid internships or paid training you know so that you will at least get some knowledge and you will at least get some certificate which you can put in your cv and you know that might result in getting some scholarships you know from those universities where you are you know planning to go abroad so think about giving gre TOEFL and IELTS are both English language exams. Since in being an Indian, we don't come from an English English language speaking country, we have to give TOEFL and IELTS. So yes, again, you want to double verify or cross check which exam they want. Mostly IELTS and TOEFL are accepted, you know, by almost every university. But there are some exp uh, ex uh, exceptions. GMAT. Yes, GMAT is ex exclusively required for those who want to change their field and they want to go for an MBA. But again, there are many universities uh, in different countries which does not even ask for GMAT. So again, don't waste your time and money in you know going for such classes which are into GR and TOEFL coaching. Okay. Now, yeah, um, I think I was discussing you know why you have to go abroad because uh, you know. there are industries in different sectors we already have uh, discussed you know what kind of industries are there and in india unfortunately we don't have specialized courses and the courses which you know you can see in front of you hardly any courses are run by indian institutes in india so for instance you know uh, masters in cell biology masters in you know food innovation management masters in bio resource engineering masters in biomedical engineering masters in regenerative medicine molecular oncology there are so many subjects that you know you can be specialized and a masters course has to be a specialized course because that then only you know uh, you can start looking for an employment so these are some of the courses i thought i can uh, you know show you uh, and these are the masters courses or master specialization or specialized courses one can opt for during their masters or during even bachelors there are some students who wants to change their discipline uh you know they they don't like uh, laboratory work uh, they don't prefer that so they feel that their management skills are very good so 10 years you know 10 15 years back uh when anyone used to change the course you know i mean for example if i have done bachelors in biotech and suppose i want to do management 15 years back that was considered as a stupid thing okay because then we used to ask everyone then why you opted for biotech if you want to go for management why you are opting for why you opted for biotech in your bachelors but now the situation has changed drastically now 
industries also require or they want students or candidates who have a dual specialization for instance bachelor's in biotech masters in you know management or mba so this is a unique specialization where the industries can place that candidate you know on a higher level of the industry on a higher you know a um, little bit you know uh, uh, hierarchy wise so that they can take the technical decisions with respect to the you know uh, economic uh, economic platform whether to launch this particular product or not so you know a management uh, skills also are equally important nowadays when you are actually looking for you know some kind of employment but of course it is not uh, i mean if you if you feel that management is something that you would like to do then of course this is a very good there are many universities which has a, a courses which will uh, talk about you know management or mba in the context of uh, you know biotech industry so of course uh, that specialization also is very very good right so at, i'm at the end of my presentation so I, what i thought you know i can show you some nice logos of some you know top universities across the globe so starting from the uk you know these are the some universities where uh, which are in the top uh, you know 15 in the world king's college university of glasgow uh, ucl oxford cambridge imperial college london edinburgh and all um us again it's a very big country uh, they have also decent universities uh, you know uh, mit purdue caltech stanford uh, harvard and you know all of these australia again it's a very good country um, they uh, i mean of course they are a big country and that's why you know they have certain universities which are really really good ranked um, adelaide university monash dickin rmit latrobe university of queensland uh curtin you know and these like universities they have a variety of courses and uh, with scholarships yeah right so um, i'm also going to talk about ireland um, there are two irelands in the world first is you know North, northern ireland which is a part of the uk and there's a southern ireland uh, which is a part of the europe i'm sure everyone must have heard that you know uh, uk decided to exit from the european union so uh, because of that now ireland is the only english speaking country in the entire europe it's uh, you know not even uh, you know having a total population of size of pune and mumbai all together so it's very less populated country but very very good when it comes to biopharmaceutical employment the reason is very you know obvious that they have almost 23 out of 25 top biopharma industries in the world they have their presence in the ireland most of these industries uh, are from us so i mean uh, because of the us policies most of the projects are being you know outsourced to ireland and one third of the population you know they are in working in the life science sector okay so you name most of the top industries like abbott astrazeneca uh, you know merck pfizer they have their presence in ireland and they are recruiting like anything and most importantly ireland is very small country so they have very small you know i mean they have very uh, less number of universities and out of that there are only two or three universities are very good like ucd and trinity college dublin or ucc and there they have courses you know so they have a very good success ratio of you know around 97 98% of the employment you know students get employment okay 2% of course because of their own things because uh, i mean see no country is going to give you a guarantee about the jobs it is about your own merits how you crack the interview and what kind of skill sets that you develop during your masters course based on that it will be decided whether you get a job in that country or not uh, a country like new zealand again is a very small country but it is very good for dairy technology or microbiology related subjects so yes new zealand also is a good option um, i thought you know, i can put you a kind of overall stats of how much it costs but again please don't go on this slide because it varies from country to country city to city so uh, there are two aspects of studying abroad one is called as a tuition fees and se second is called as a cost of living okay living expenses rather so in any of these countries a typical living expenses are around 10 lakhs per annum and the tuition fees will keep changing from university to university and country to country so with this i think i'll stop what i want to um, you know conclude from this entire seminar is Uh, first of all you have to decide what you want to do and we indians have a habit of looking for jobs once we complete our degree okay this is what we do but i always tell my students to take one more step ahead or one more leap ahead instead of starting you know instead of starting looking for jobs after completion of degree why not to search for the jobs first and then do a masters course accordingly for an instance if you know uh, if i want to work in biopharma sector and if i am a bachelor student 
what i would advise you first of all understand the num- you know different industries across the globe who are into biopharma sector second thing understand the, you know go to their websites and understand the vacancies what these are, industries are having third thing once you understand the vacancies understand the skill sets okay what these industries are expecting and i think you should make a nice comparison in in your notebook or you know maybe your on your laptop whatever and then you will understand that you know some vacancies have a common skill sets required and once you understand the common skill sets i think that is the time you should think in order to cover these or learn these skill sets which master's course will be right suitable for me and if you do that and then you can start looking for a specific master's course in specific university and if you do this exercise guys you don't even need to you know start looking for employment after you complete your masters because you already know where you you have to apply okay before your masters so once you complete your masters you just have to send your cv that's it you know because your chances will also be very high because you have done a masters course which actually industries require or what they want okay so with this i think i'll stop uh, thank you so much again sharvari and asif sir and you know entire pdg uh, life science team and you know thank you again to every one of you i hope this session was very useful and uh, i'm open to take any questions in case if you have over to you sharvari thank you so much anu for such a valuable and informative talk and i believe all the participants must be uh, must get a benefit from this as you all can see on the slides my dear participants there is a contact uh, email id as well as phone number given to you so all of you can please contact us we are, we will be pleased to help you out with this venture and uh, we have also i have also put once again in the chat box the admission form you can put up your details and get back to us get a con- get a contact with us and now the topic is open for all your questions please take maximum benefit of the resource person over to you uh, means you all can ask the questions i'll unmute and ask the participant any hello yes uh, uh- i have one question i have completed my master degree and now i'm working as a research assistant so but i want to pursue my phd abroad so what country uh, you i you think that uh, it will be good for me which country will be good for me so yeah i think it's a good question uh, because you know i i think i forgot to mention one of some of the things uh you know when when it comes to a phd you know it's all about an independent research so you know uh, a phd is sub, you know a phd candidate is supposed to do an independent research in the specific labs in the western countries so a principal investigator in those you know universities or let's let's call them professors they expect their candidates you know that they should be independent uh, in their working they should know how to do a research and they should have at least good publication before they are recruited for a phd so unfortunately what happens uh that students who are applying for phd from india their masters degrees are not recognized by this university with obvious reasons because they feel that the indian masters curriculum is having lots of theoretical subjects rather than the practical subjects and if a student is not having you know uh, first author publications in reputed journals they don't consider any of these applications so if you have a good publication in uh, nature the journals or articles like nature i think uh, surely you, you do hold a very good chance and then any of the context any country would be best suitable for you so what i would advise you in this case is uh, you can decide which area you want to work and understand who be i mean who are working in that area because you know any of the research articles will have a lot of references you know so you can just you know go there and uh, you know just have to communicate with them and asking them if they have any you know phd vacancies okay thank you sir yeah i think uh, shweta is or something like yeah hello hi samita this side yeah. so sir actually what happened like i have done my masters already so right. like I, if can i do masters or any specialization course again like is it yeah. possible to do yeah that's a good question again so yes you can do another master so you know in this case i would uh, recommend you to go for one year masters course because you know again doing another two years masters it would be wastage of time and money so this time i think you have to be more cautious about what masters you have to go with because i think you know if you know what area of sort specialization or specialized courses you know that slide if you remember you have to be very cautious while selecting a specific type of masters okay 
and in that case you know you can start going ahead with that particular masters which will definitely help you yeah, so yeah actually, you can do that actually i have done my masters in biotechnology and now i am working as a research assistant uh, in uh, i mean it's a ca- on cancer only like in oncology so right. like i prefer so hello yeah yeah, yeah I so you. i would like to do on molecular oncology only so is it possible like which countries are comf- i mean preferable can you please tell me yeah so <clears throat> specifically you know since you have done two years masters i would always recommend uk or ireland or specifically uk because the reason is very obvious they have specialized courses in cancer you know cancer cell biology or molecular oncology uh, that's number one second thing it's one year course third thing uk has a lot of funding so you know if you are interested in, in in doing a phd after you complete your masters or let's say those who are, are interested in doing a phd i would recommend them that you know you can go with one one more masters let's say in the uk you complete that one year's masters you develop your skill sets and you know you get good recommendations because phd is all about a good recommendations coming from a right supervisors so you can get all these things in one year's masters course let's say from the uk and then you can start applying for phd and uk is a country where you have a lot of funding opportunities so getting a do you have any universities in mind like uh, which are preferable universities there are so many universities university of sussex where i did my masters from manchester birmingham you know again depending upon what kind of profile you have maybe we can discuss that later of course you know one to one maybe uh, you know where i can guide you properly what kind of uh, universities might be suitable for you in terms of scholarships also so yes we can definitely uh, talk about that uh, how can i contact you like uh... i think that uh, email id was there sure maybe you want to uh, i mean put yeah, uh, yeah. uh yes yeah, see we have uh, we had put the email id and contact uh, uh, dr anup can you please share that slide once again just do that again yeah so on this uh, shweta we have our contact details this is a contact phone number which we have provided you can always call on this number and we can fix up appointment for further details also i have put in the chat box the admission form the uh, there you have to put your details it's a kind of form where we will get your details and we will start counseling you so these are three ways of easy contact to us so feel free any time we welcome you for the further assistance thank you it's my pleasure yeah anyone else has any questions हेलो यस गुड इवनिंग सर सर दिस इज राजेश्वरी यस हाय सर आई हैव कंप्लीटेड लाइक लास्ट ईयर आई हैव ग्रेजुएटेड विद माइक्रोबायोलॉजी डिपार्टमेंट एंड सिंस आई वांटेड टू गो फॉर एमएससी इन वायरोलॉजी बट माय फादर डिडंट अप्रूव फॉर दैट सो करेंटली आई एम डूइंग पोस्ट ग्रेजुएशन डिप्लोमा इन हॉस्पिटल मैनेजमेंट uh but uh, now next year i i definitely want to go for msc in virology and also i have selected some of the college like i wanted to go for usa and i selected some of the uh, colleges to be pursued but uh, i am not getting proper information like uh, the scholarships and also can you guide me for that yeah sure we can always that i think you know as sharvari suggested you can always contact on you know fill up the form and you know maybe we can fix an appointment and we can discuss everything in detail so yes definitely i can help you in that oh uh, i have filled uh, i have filled the form sir and also i'm not getting any like any uh, proper guidance for that even you said you said that some of the people are going for gre and uh, yeah. you, you know like they are wasting their time so yes i have uh, i have applied for one of the classes over here uh, like i live in mumbai i live in mira road over here and right. i have applied for classes in jamburi uh, jamburi classes from there they are going to like go fill up my uh, they are going to give me a uh, whole thing like they are going to make my sops lor with a minimal cost so should i go for that and uh the thing is that i have got one job in sericulture so can i take up msc virology uh, over uh, the sericulture because i want a, i want a hands on experience right now right so, so you are that, yeah. that 
Yeah, so that there are so many questions. I think you know, I can uh, <laughs> we can discuss in detail again, you know, specifically. Yes, sir. But one thing I would tell you, you know, uh, I would always ask my, I always recommend my students to write their own SOP because you know this is a field of you know practical exposure. You know, we have to write a technical SOP. I mean, usually uh, students write SOP, uh, you know, and they don't even write anything technically. So, I mean, in the statement of purpose, you have to write what you have learned. You know, if, you know, in your bachelor's or in your you know work experience. So uh, I would never ask you know anyone to write my own SOP. So please uh, make a habit of writing your own SOP because that will definitely help you once you go there, because no one is going to study for you once you land there. So don't opt for any services which can give you everything ready-made. So you know okay. I think you put more efforts where we can definitely help you in that. But yes. you write your own SOP. But yeah, we can discuss your case in detail maybe one to one or the phone call or something. Yes. Uh, maybe you can contact Shervari for that. Yes, sir. thank yes, you so much. Sure, I would be glad to help you, Rajeshwari. You have many queries, and <laughs> I think Dr. Anup is the right person who can guide you. Really, I feel so. Yes, and uh, somebody has put in the chat box that uh, can the person fill up the form later on because person is not sure about uh, the subject interested in. Of course, you can uh, put the uh, that detail later on, but if you want a proper guidance and you are confused with the subject, I think Dr. Anup will be in a position to help you with that also. So if you don't want to get into that subject details, it should not be a barrier to contact to us. So you contact us, we will guide you uh, on that also. Is it clear? Am I clear for your doubt? I think uh, Shweta or someone is having any question. Uh, she's asking to unmute. All right, all right. Shweta, are you there? I have made unmute to you. Yeah, any other yeah, question? Actually, yeah, actually, Shweta, I have asked. Yes, Shweta, please tell me. I think you are on mute, so maybe that's I why. Have, I have been trying to unmute her, but she's, for some strange reason, she's not getting unmute. Maybe, Shweta, you can type your message. Uh, you yeah, know, please do uh, type in the chat box, Shweta, if you can't uh, speak on your microphone. I will just uh, repeat it for Dr. Anu. Any other questions anyone has? Anyone else? I think uh, Devyani has asked me a question. Can you please tell me about some fully funded scholarships? Okay. Uh, again, this is a very good question because I told you scholarships are there by most of the universities. So the criteria for scholarships is your academics. You know, not only academics, they will also check which university, uh, you know, you have done your bachelor's education and uh, you know where you have done your bachelor's or what kind of experience you have they will also uh, check for uh, you know your subject wise performance your practical exposure and um, you have to understand that you know uh, for fully funded scholarships there are you know very limited fully funded scholarships so uh, everyone applies for fully funded scholarships so it's very very competitive so if you feel that you are competitive enough or you have very good credentials uh, you know chances of getting fully funded scholarships are always high Okay, I'll repeat the question from Tarani. Uh, I'm currently working on PhD. Is there any possibility to get any internship kind of still development abroad? Yeah, Please there are possibilities, yeah. yes. Uh, again, we can discuss one-to-one -one because uh, PhD is very specific stream, so I understand that. And uh, again, it depends on which area you want to, uh, you know, have a skill development or internships kind of thing. Uh, you know, there are many countries which can, or universities which can allow you to be a part of that university for a couple of months or three months, where you can, you know, develop your skill sets. And again, you can come back to India, and, you know, you can start doing your, continuing your PhD. So this is quite possible. Anyone else? I repeat once again that contact details through mail, through phone number have been put up on the slide. Please uh, take a note of it. Also, you can refer to the form which has been put in the chat box. And we are really eagerly waiting for more and more responses through this webinar. 
yes uh, can i want to ask this question i have a question i'm doing my masters in immunology currently in my first semester and i want to work abroad should i continue this course and then do masters abroad or finish and then do another masters course abroad right uh, you know again i think there are many things which are not uh, clearly mentioned so uh, see if you want i mean one thing is clear that you know if you want to work abroad i think you will have to go with another masters abroad so uh, i cannot comment on whether you should stop this masters course because i mean i have to understand your bachelors and masters where you are posting from what are your grades and maybe we can discuss that one to one because uh, i don't want to you know i mean since half of the information is given i don't want to like you know uh, you know advise uh, you know something which is wrong so i think you know once i understand your situation properly i can guide you properly okay kamai you are most welcome to contact us anyone else please yes i'll just repeat the question uh hello sir i have completed btech uh, sorry b biotechnology and certification in clinical research i want a job in clinical research is mba in healthcare useful for me or not uh <clears throat> depends again what you are learning and from where you are learning that you know doing that particular course so typically if you want to work for clinical uh, research uh, i think there are specific masters like masters in clinical research or uh, you know masters in toxicology in research those kind of masters which are very specialized masters which can give you a lot of scope in you know uh, clinical research domain also you know mba hospital uh, management courses also will give you but that will be a different job because hospital management and clinical research are even though they are a part of the same page but they have different things so again it depends on what exactly you want to do but yes mba uh, can you know give you a good employment but assuming that you are doing an mba from a reputed university uh, with a you know good curriculum okay i hope uh, you've got cleared with your doubt yes okay uh, there is one more question dr anu yeah uh, i'm you know who was completed bsc in biotech if i want to apply for masters in biotech can i start the process right okay i think uh, one thing again i forgot to ask so i forgot to mention that if you want to go in 2022 the applications would start one year before so for september 2022 intake the admissions uh, will start or already started in this october so you know the from 1st of october or month of october one year before the applications would start so uh, you know uh, i think this is a right time where you know you can complete all the documentation and you know we can start your process of you know applications so yes i mean this is a right time basically okay i think uh, your doubt is clear tanvi is it so in short the applications have already started uh, you know we have to make sure that you know your applications goes there in time you know in order to make sure that you know you will get some scholarship uh, if your academics are strong anyone else hello yes please yes sir uh, i wanted to ask that after doing ms and after pursuing job and all of that in which country it is easier to get a pr like what right. will you prefer see uh, i think it's a i mean it's a good question rather uh, see getting a pr is a very different thing um, i mean it is usually said that canada and australia are the good countries which can you know give you pr but trust me getting a pr is not that easy nowadays because if uh, it was easy i think uh, every indian would have rushed there in canada or australia so it is not that easy uh it all depends on you know how many years i mean they, you have to basically complete their norms and you know regulations you have to stay there for minimum number of years you have to show that you have a specific salary according to their norm so uh, then only you have some certain chances of getting a pr but uh, in our field canada is not that great because we they don't have more industries in biotech so obvious choice i would always suggest is australia because at least australia has you know multiple uh, sectors like clinical research or you know industrial biotech or to some extent immunology where you can you know start working in the industry and maybe you can apply for pr after you know few years 
Okay, sir. And uh, for biopharma, you told that Ireland is a good option. Yeah, it's a good option, obviously. I mean, with respect to every other country, English-speaking country, I always focus on English-speaking country because their degrees are recognized all, all uh, across the globe. So with respect to that biopharma, uh, for biopharma, Ireland is a decent option because they have multiple industries. Sure. Any other country other than biopharma, like, uh, other than Ireland for biopharma? Uh, then Australia or US would be a good one. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was really insightful. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I'm glad to know your kind words. Anybody else? Uh, yes. Uh, Tanveen is asking again, I think, the country which is best for bioinformatics, sir. Uh, there are two types of bioinformatics as far as I know about bioinformatics. One is, you know, something which is into coding or language platform where you can uh, design the tools, you know, uh, by using software or, you know, different databases, you can actually, you know, construct those tools. So that is one part of bioinformatics. And the second part of bioinformatics is actually you are using those tools as a day-to-day -day life. Okay. So uh, the first one is pretty good in, in either Ireland or in US where you can actually, you know, learn different languages like R, MATLAB, you know, Perl, Python. And you can make different uh, databases or tools for you know solving different problems. And if you want to be on the second part where you want to utilize you know or use those databases, I think UK uh, is a good country because many uh, PhD positions or you know many professors or industries they want to you know use those tools to solve different problems. So there UK would be a different you know good option for you. So depending upon what kind of bioinformatics you want to go with. All right, so anybody else? Wait, uh, okay. So one more question, sir, from Tarani. From current research, I could see European countries are, European countries are doing a lot in energy and sustainability, but how tough is it to get into varsity? Their eligibility is little different from others. Uh, I don't know exactly what you mean. So I, I, I am assuming that you want to work in energy and sustainability sector. So uh, it is not it is not tough, first of all, uh, to get into university. If you have the right academics, then, you know, if you're fulfilling their criteria, uh, it is not difficult to get into those universities because they are very straightforward, unlike uh, Canadian or US universities. Uh, of course, some non-English speaking European countries are a bit stringent because they expect a lot of documentation from your side. But if it is an English speaking country like Ireland or UK, uh, for an instance, they're easy and very straightforward when it comes to, you know, um, admissions and applications. And uh, eligibility criteria will change from university to university. The best universities will have very stringent criteria. You know, the middle ranked universities will have little bit relaxed criteria. All right, uh, anybody else? I think uh, we are over with the questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tarani. Yeah, so Dr. Anu, can I conclude the session? Yes, please, sure. Yeah, so thanks once again, Dr. Anu, for such an informative and enlightening session. And I thank all the participants on behalf of BDG Life Sciences and uh, Ignatio Zillis as well. So we are eagerly waiting for your response. We would be glad to help you one and one. Uh, so please take the benefit of all the contact details that we have provided. And with on that note, I would like to uh, end the session and thank you so much. Have a great day ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Anup. So I'll just end the meeting. Thank, thank you. you.